directional derivatives and the gradient. So as usual, let's kind of look back to things we've seen and what do we know so far. We know partial derivatives. If we have a function f of x, y is equal to z, we know that there are partials of f with respect to x and y, and they represent the change in the output with respect to a change in direction of the either x or y axis, respectively. OK, what else do we know? So differentiability means that we should be able to consider the change in output if we move in any direction. Remember, think back to when we first started talking about partial derivatives. Uh, we said, hey, that's great, but I feel like if I'm standing on a surface and I want to walk around in directions of uh, increase and decrease, I, I don't just want to be limited to walking in directions that are parallel to the x and y axis, but rather any direction from the point I'm standing at. So enter directional derivatives. So is there a derivative in every direction? Absolutely. Oh, look, I said what was already coming on the slide. OK, instead of thinking about these partials as the change in output with respect to a change in direction related to the axes, let's think of them as a change in output with respect to a directional vector. Instead of the vectors being in the direction of the axes, this time it's any old direction. A vector defines any old direction of travel from our uh, point. So in the with respect to our original things, we understand our partials in the direction of with respect to x and y. So partial f with respect to x is the change in output with respect to one unit in uh, the change of one unit in the direction of x, which is the standard unit vector i in the x direction. And the partial with respect to f, uh, partial of f with respect to y is the change in output output with respect to uh, a one unit change in the direction of y, which is our standard unit vector j. So can we consider moving in any direction, say in the direction of an arbitrary, notice the word unit vector here, because remember, the derivative tells us the slope of a tangent line to a surface in a direction, and slope is rise over run over run. If we define run to be one, then slope is the, the, the slope number represents the change in the vertical direction. So if I move, ask ourselves, if I move in any direction u, how quickly is the function output changing and to which direction? As usual, directional derivatives tell us the slope of the tangent line to a surface. And here's a nice uh, applet here. And here we have a nice little applet that shows, hey, we've got ourselves a surface. And I can see that there's a unit vector that starts at some input point, two, three in particular here. And if I wanted to travel in any direction, I just would need to change the direction I was looking. Think of the direction as of you or I looking as if we're standing at that point on top of that surface as the direction that you points in. And as you can see, as we uh, move direction, we're gonna get a different tangent line and that tangent line is gonna have a different slope in each of the directions. All right, back to our slides. So there we're going to introduce actually two definitions of the directional derivative. Um, one is what, the way OpenStax presents it, and the other is the way Apex Calculus presents it. So what we first need is a unit vector, and that's going to define the direction that we're interested in. So definition, the differentiable function for a differentiable function f of x, y is equal to z, and a unit vector u, the directional derivative at x naught, y naught, the input point, in the direction of u is the derivative in the direction of u of the function f. That's how we'd read this, the derivative of our function f in the direction of u, evaluated at a particular point, is going to be given by the partial of x evaluated in that point times the x component of our directional vector, plus the partial of y evaluated at that point times the y component of our directional unit vector. Unit is important, I keep emphasizing it here. So notice the output's a number. 
It's the slope of the tangent line to the surface at our input point in the direction of u. Now, the second definition is the angle as a direction. These definitions are the definition. Sorry, if this isn't totally clear, perhaps it's not. The definitions I'm referring to, the angle as a direction and unit vector as a direction, these, these definitions are the def different definitions that really mean the same thing as we'll see shortly of the directional derivative. So let f be as above, then the directional derivative in the direction of angle theta at x naught y naught is the same, only it's going to be cosine of theta, uh, the partial with respect to x evaluated at a point times cosine of theta plus the partial of y with the partial of f with respect to y evaluated at a point times the sine of theta. So this begets the question, why are there two definitions? They look awful similar. How are they different? Well, they're different like this. Are those things really different? Well, here's where the key idea is and the fact of this is why it's important that we use a unit vector always. For a unit vector, u having components u1 and u2, then as you can see down here in the image, just look at the image. It's the unit circle, right? Why is it the unit circle? Well, because we're dealing with a unit vector. That unit vector is a radius of that circle shown. And so we've got a circle of radius one, unit circle here. And from way back in trigonometry, we know that any point on the unit circle has coordinates, cosine of theta, sine of theta. And so the highlights I had are gone. I want them back. So I'm gonna get them back. Don't know if these are the same colors, but it doesn't much matter. So notice here that sure enough, x is equal to cosine of theta is u1. u1 is the same thing as cosine of theta. And y is equal to sine of theta is the same thing as u2. And so that's why those two definitions look different, but are in fact the same. Sometimes we might be given a unit vector to work with. Sometimes we might be given a direction. Um, it's up to you if you want to convert between the two, but it's very possible. All right, your actual der derivatives. Let's do some examples. Let f be ln of x to the fifth plus y to the second at the point and at the point negative one, two input point. Let's find the derivative in the direction of factor three, one. If you're noticing, I, I casually slid the words, let's find the derivative in there. Let's just put this directional derivative. Let's just go ahead and, and plop this in where. Uh, let f be this and then find the directional derivative at the point. There we go, I fixed it. Um, we're gonna work the problem twice. We're gonna do it once involving both definitions. First, we'll do the unit, unit vector definition. Okay, so what are we gonna need? What are we gonna need? There are gonna be some common calculations here. We've got our unit vector definition, our angle direction definition there. And the common calculations to both are these partial derivatives evaluated at our point. So let's go ahead and do those common calculations. The partial with respect to f, uh, x of our function f is going to be 1 over x to the fifth plus y to the second times uh, 5x to the fourth. And that is because we're taking the derivative of the natural logarithm. Derivative of the natural logarithm is 1 over the input. And since it's a chain rule, it's going to be 1 over the unchanged input there uh, times the derivative of the inside. And since we're taking it with respect to the x, it's going to be 5x to the fourth. Similarly, or, oh, well, let's evaluate that at the point negative one, two first, slap in some X's and Y's, evaluate that out, see that we get five thirds. Similar logic, taking the partial derivative of ln of X to the fifth plus Y sec to the second with respect to Y is going to give us one over X to the fifth plus Y squared times two Y, which when we slap in our input point is gonna give us negative four over three. So common calculations successfully done and logged, summarized, if you will. Uh, now let's do, since we're tackling first the unit vector definition, we need ourselves a unit vector, I'll call it u sub v, in the direction of v. To do that, we first need to find the magnitude of v, which is going to give us v the square root of 10. And then we need to scale New vector v down to unit length as we know how to do and multiplying by one over the magnitude of v uh, and then we see that we get vector v a u of v u sub v being three root ten and one root ten 
for the x and y components respectively, or u1 and u2 in our equation. Then as usual, it becomes a game of substitution. We go ahead and get our partials slapped in there. And then we go ahead and input in our unit vector components. Do that math and get that the derivative in the direction of 3, 1 evaluated in the direction of 3, 1 at the point negative 1, 2, or perhaps I should say the derivative at the point negative 1, 2 in the direction of 3, 1 is about 1.1595. Now on to the angle definition. Well, here we're not given an angle. So we're gonna have to, like I said, it was it was possible to go between the two definitions. We're gonna fire up a little bit of trigonometry and figure out our angle. So tangent of theta is equal to y over x or opposite over adjacent, if you will. And uh, if we haul off and think of vector v as just a vector in the plane, x, y, uh, we would go over three and then up one. And sure enough, all right, we got ourselves an x, a y value on an x. There you go, opposite over adjacent, y over x, however you like to think about it. You're gonna end up with tangent of theta is equal to one over three. Uh, a little bit of trig, inverse trig in particular, uh, is gonna give you that theta is equal to arc tangent of one over three. And that is those relatively long decimals in both radians and degrees that are shown below. Now, I did an easy one. This was in the first quadrant, but as we've seen before in some of our prior assignments, you may have to reconcile the output of arctangent with for whatever quadrant uh, your vector is actually in, as the output of arctangent varies between negative pi over two and pi over two only. So the first and fourth quadrants, if you will. There we go. Nice little picture just to say, hey, that actually makes some sense. Looks pretty good. Okay, putting it all together, it again becomes a game of substitution. We already know our partials with respect to x and y. This is a highlighter, not an arrow. So we'll slap those guys in there. And now we just need to fill in our cosine of theta and sine of theta using our angle that we calculated. And do that math and of course it's the same thing it's the same problem just written and thought about in a different way it better be the same solution otherwise we broke math and that wouldn't be good okay in either case we got the same number and it tells us the slope of the tangent line to the surface at uh one the point one comma two the input point one comma two in the direction of three one so if we're to look at this let's see go ahead and launch that All right, and so now that this is launched, what we've got is we've got our surface and notice in the plane, I have plotted the directional vector, three, one. And if you look at it from above, you can see that at the point on the surface related to the input of um, negative one, two, we've got our point and you can see that the tangent line is in that direction of travel. And the slope that we got is of this tangent line is gonna be given by our derivative. And so if we look at the slope just in this direction. We look at that and say, hey, let me see, I've got the, uh, sorry, let me get the axes in the correct orientation such that looking at this will give us a positive slope line as it should. Now we've got the X direction pointing off to the right. A little bit, you'll have to imagine it's perfect there. But I look at that line and say, sure, it looks like it has a slightly greater than one slope. All right, back to the slides. I'll get that. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to close this out and avoid that for you, but. All right, now we're back. Okay, so. The next concept in our discussion of directional derivatives is something called the gradient. The gradient of a function f of x, y is equal to z is defined to be this little upside down triangle thing, which is called a nabla, N-A-B-L-A, uh, as a symbol if you want, I'm curious. But uh, that upside down triangle f is an outputs, it's a function. It, you take it of a function as an input and you get a vector 
that has as its components the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y of that function f that you're inputting into the gradient. So you think of this little symbol as an operator on a function. You give it a function, it spits out an output. And that output is a vector with the f with a partial of x and the partial of y as its components. Yep, so give it an input function, it gives you a vector. Uh, so instead of calling it the upside down triangle, it's called a nabla, but we don't say nabla f. What we say is del f or the gradient of f. You may have heard me mispronounce um, partial derivatives by saying del a lot. Uh, and you should say it partial of f with respect to x, but uh, del is reserved for the gradient. Okay, so now why is this important? Well, we're gonna see lots of things we can do with it, but one of the key things we can do with it for now is we're gonna use this operation to turn that directional derivative calculation into a dot product. So let's look at the directional derivative and we're gonna redefine it. The directional derivative of a function f as usual in the direction of u, a unit length vector. Still, it's gotta be still a unit length vector. The derivative of f in the direction of u is equal to del f dot u, the gradient of f dot, the gradient vector of f dotted with our directional unit vector u. So let's revisit the same example we did before. Here's hoping we get the same answer. Uh, the gradient, let's calculate the gradient. Well, we've already calculated the f partial of x and the partial of f with respect to y as well. So we are going to borrow that work and we're going to input that. Remember, the gradient puts out as its as a, its vector, the partial of function f and the partial of function f with respect to y as the output. And that's what we've got there. So now unit vector length, well, we already took 3, 1 and, and unitized it, if you will. So that's what the our directional vector is as a unit length. Now we're going to dot these two vectors together. Remember the, the definition we have of is the gradient being dotted with our unit vector. And so there we go. And well, how do you take the dot product? Well, you multiply the components and add them together. So multiplying the x components together, we get this expression. Multiplying the y components together, we get this expression. Add them together, we get that. Now this gives us a function. Now we've got a derivative in the direction of u, uh, I'm sorry, at point u rather, let me just read this, which gives a directional derivative for any point on our surface in the direction of v. What we don't have is the input point, but we could we could plug in any input point and get the directional derivative with respect to the direction v. Okay, so let's 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 use this. Let's apply this. We're going to evaluate this directional derivative in the direction of v at the point that we're interested in, negative 1, 2. So we're going to substitute in for all the x's, negative 1, and all the y's, negative 2. Uh, when you get that all done, happily, we arrive at the same result that we did before, 1.1595. Again. OK, what else can we do with the gradient? Well, the gradient tells us uh, the direction of greatest increase and decrease. So think back to the relationship of, between geometry and the dot product. We had the one definition for the dot product as v dot u as the magnitude of v times the magnitude of u times cosine of theta, the uh, angle between v and u as vectors. Well, if we apply this definition to the, the directional derivative dot product definition of the gradient and a unit vector, the gradient of f dotted with u, we're going to, here we've got this. We're going to apply that definition. OK, so now the right-hand side becomes this. What do we notice here? Well, this is kind of redundant because what is the magnitude of a unit vector? It's necessarily 1. And so anything multiplied by 1 is just itself. So that expression tidies up nicely to the magnitude of the gradient times cosine of theta. So the title of this slide says, the gradient tells us about the direction of the greatest increase or decrease. So when will this expression be maximized? This expression right here. Well, we know that 
cosine varies between negative one and one, no matter what the angle. And so the largest, uh, the largest value of anything multiplied by cosine is going to be when cosine of theta is equal to one. And so cosine of theta is equal to one when theta is equal to zero. Well, theta is the angle between these two vectors, isn't it? You know, theta is the angle between vectors u and v. In our case, u and v are del f and u. And so if the angle between them is zero, that means that the gradient is pointing in the same direction as our unit vector. And the consequence of this is that the gradient always points in the direction of greatest increase from a point on our surface. So um, let's look at this a little bit further. F of x, y, z as usual, a differentiable function, x naught, y naught be our input point and u be a unit vector. Then the direction of greatest increase is going to be the gradient evaluated at that point, the steepest ascent. If you imagine standing on the surface and you calculate the gradient vector, it's going to point in the direction of steepest ascent, the greatest uphill. So when it, what is the actual maximum value of the directional derivative? Um, at any point, it's going to be the magnitude of the gradient. So if the if it points in the greatest increase is in the direction of the gradient, then the greatest the direction of the greatest decrease or the steepest descent, the fastest downhill, is going to be the negative, the opposite direction of the gradient evaluated at that point. And then uh, the gradient, the dir directional derivative is going to be minimized at negative the magnitude of our gradient. So here's a picture that kind of shows that, where the blue vector is the direction of greatest decrease, negative the gradient, and the orange vector is the gradient, pointing in the direction of most rapid increase. Uh, notice the two little green uh, vectors that sort of look like they're tangent to the surface there. Notice if you were to walk on the surface along that green line in the direction of either of those vectors, you wouldn't change. It's a level curve. You'd stay at the same altitude or height, if you will. And we'll talk about that shortly. So let's do an example. At input point 1, 1, find the direction in which our function f is equal to x squared over 3 plus y squared over 3 is most increasing rapidly, decreasing most rapidly, and has a direction of no change. So there's our paraboloid looking thing. And uh, there's the point p kind of and on it plotted. All right, so common calculations here. Uh, first, we need the gradient. The gradient is going to give us the uh, a vector of the partial derivatives. Remember, gradient f equals partial of x, partial of y as a vector. So calculate our partial with respect to x is going to be 2 thirds x. Uh, partial with respect to y, 2 thirds y. There's your gradient. Uh, so where is the direction of greatest increase at our point? At our point one one, we're going to evaluate that at the direct at the gradient. Evaluate the gradient at that point. You're going to get uh, two thirds x times one. Put this one into there. Put this one into there. That's how we get these little guys. So that's the direction of greatest increase. Uh, and the maximum rate of change here. Well, the directional derivative is maximized when we take the magnitude of this, uh, and that magnitude is 2 root 2 over 9. All right, and so here's an image of that. So notice down below uh, on the coordinate plane, we have our unit length vector uh, in the direction of the gradient, and that green vector is the direction of greatest change plotted up on the, uh, showing the tangent line, the directional derivative, showing the actual slope, the direction of greatest change standing at that point. So decreasing most rapidly is you're imagining, hey, it's just the opposite direction and it is, and the minimum rate's gonna be the opposite of the magnitude. So you've got that red vector there, which points in the direction of the greatest decrease. Now, where is the direction of no change? So the direction of no change, well, what do we know about the dot product? Um, 
Well, the direction of no change is going to be when the gradient dotted with the unit vector is equal to zero. Um, uh, that's when we're going to have our unit vector is going to be orthogonal to the gradient. And to just see that, look back at this prior picture and say, hey, where would where you expect the direction of no change to be? Well, we'd imagine if we were to draw a nice level curve here. Oops, that's not a very good one. Nice level curve there. Then the direction of no change would be these tangent vectors right there. This green vector is the gradient and u being the direction we're interested in. What do you notice about u and the gradient? Well, they're orthogonal to each other. So the direction of no change is going to be the, the gradient dotted with u when it's equal to 0. So if we were to dot the gradient with u and set it equal to 0, we would get this expression down here. So 2 thirds ux two thir plus 2 thirds uy. And when is this going to be true? Well, in our case, you can kind of just guess that it's going to be true when they're, since the coefficients are equal, the inputs have to be equal. And so we just chose one. You could say negative two, two, you wouldn't be wrong, but negative one, one's a little easier to see. And we can scale that down to unit length to get the shown vector below. And then the other direction, if uh, X is positive and Y is negative, we have another direction. And there you have plotted the two uh, u vectors that we kind of drew on the last page, but plotted on our surface there. All right, so let's continue this conversation. I um, mean, we basically started to talk about level curves there, so let's make it formal and talk about the gradient and level curves. Uh, the gradient points in the direction of the fastest increase of a function from a point. What does this mean with respect to the level curves of the function? It means necessarily that the gradient is always going to be orthogonal to uh, your level curves or normal to your level curves. All right, so back at it, sorry, uh, there was a pause there. Uh, introduction, uh, gradient level curves. I'm probably rereading this, uh, apologies. The gradient points in the direction of fastest increase for a function from a point. What does this mean with respect to the level curve? of a function. Well, instead of trying to answer this question, let's just explore an example and the uh, answer will kind of come out naturally. So let's just take a look at it, this example where our function z is equal to f of x, y is going to be x squared minus y squared. And we want for y is equal to one, we want to have level curves. Uh, we're looking at this function for y is equal to one, and we're going to look at the level curves for z is equal to one, four, and nine. And when we look down to that, what do you notice about those level, uh, the gradient vectors that have been plotted with respect to uh, level curves? So we're just going to leave that there, look at it and think about it. Okay, and then in the second image, we have the surface uh, z being plotted, and we have the line in the direction of the greatest increase uh, for y equals one and the level curve with respect to those level curves that z was equal to one, four, and nine respectively. So let's take a look at this. We'll fire up this 3D graph here. I'm sorry, I, I thought I had the uh, video paused there and I left it on while I was doing that. So apologies for the moment of silence and you watching me uh, fix the display there. Uh, yeah, apologies. I try and do that when it's paused, but I, I 
hit the button, but didn't realize it didn't take. Okay, so what we're looking at is the surface plotted in 3D. And then for the intersection of the plane, y is equal to one. We, we looked at the level curves, uh, z is equal to four, z is equal to nine, z is equal to five. And we have these lines that point in the direction of greatest increase from each of those points. So the punchline here is that the gradient will always be orthogonal to the level curves of a graph. And why, why does that make a little sense? Well, the, remember the gradient points in the direction of greatest increase. And so for the level curve associated with the z is equal to four height, uh, it's not gonna be that accurate, but just pretend like we've got a level curve here on that surface where z is equal to four there. If we could imagine that z is equal to four plane would intersect the plane there or the surface there would also be over here, but we're only interested in the left part of this picture. Um, and yeah, that gradient is gonna point in the direction of greatest increase. So the gradient vector would point in that direction of travel. And so if you plotted all this flat down into the plane, what you would have is, whoops, I gotta get these annotations gone because it's taken over my ability to, oh no, I'm still in annotate mode. I'm taking over my ability to move. Notice that those, those directions of travel match those gradient vectors plotted down there in the plane. Okay, let's get back to our slides. There we go. Okay, so summarizing what I kind of just talked about a little bit, what we have is we have the gradient and level curves. So we have three level curves here and the gradient plotted for each one, including some other vectors as well, but we'll get to those. So the gradient is always gonna point in the direction of fastest increase or greatest increase. Um, notice that the gradient is always going to be orthogonal to a level curve and negative direction of the gradient is gonna point in the direction of fastest decrease. And what do you have if you wanna find if you have the directional derivative is equal to zero, that's the same as the dot product of a unit vector in the direction of direction u unit vector dotted with a gradient equal to zero. That tells us that since the gradient is orthogonal to a level curve, then that u is gonna be tangent to our level curve, meaning that u is gonna be perpendicular to our gradient. And it's gonna point in the direction of travel along the same altitude, the same height along that level curve. So if you travel in the direction of u, uh, when the directive of is zero, the, you will, the output of f will not change because you'll be traveling along the level curve. So gradients are orthogonal to level curves. In fact, the line through a point x naught y naught with vector n is equal to a b normal to that point can be written like this. We're used to thinking about lines in, in slope, point slope form or whatever, um, but instead of knowing a tangent line in the direction of the line, if you know a vector that's normal to a line at a point and that vector is AB, then you can write the equation of that line through that point X naught Y naught as A times X minus X naught plus B times quantity Y minus Y naught and set that all equal to zero. So since the gradient gives us a normal vector to level curve at a point, the gradient evaluated at x naught y naught is the partial evaluated at, of f, at the partial of x evaluated at that point, and the partial of y evaluated at that point in vector coordinate form. Then we can substitute these values into that above equation, and we have tangent lines to a level curve for any value output value of c of our function at a given point is given by the partial with respect to x evaluated at a point times x minus x naught plus the partial of y evaluated at a point times y minus y naught all set equal to zero. Now a long time ago I told you why I liked vertical bars as evaluated better than parentheses and that's because if you write x naught y naught like this x minus x naught oh my goodness does it ever it, it I know there's a comma here and that, that's what tells us we can't do this, but it just looks like multiplication, a little, little confusing. I personally think that this is a little more clear. Anyway, that's just a parenthetical addition to this, uh, this, this comment, this conversation. Uh, gradients, again, continue our conversation about gradients being orthogonal to level curves. Here we have an example where our level curve is z is equal to two for the function f or z is equal to one fourth 
x squared plus y squared. Calculating the gradient, we see that the gradient of the function f is 1 half x comma 2y. Uh, if we evaluate at our point of interest, which is negative 2 comma 1, we get negative 1, 2. Sort of coincidence that those numbers are all the same, just in different orders. And we can find the tangent line to our level curve at this point, negative 2 comma 1. And then we have our, our gradient vector, which points out in the negative 1 direction, positive 2. There's your gradient vector. And we can see from the picture it's uh, normal to the tangent line. But by substituting in these values, the partial of x with respect to the partial of f with respect to x evaluated at our point, that's our negative 1. And then the partial of y with respect to x, uh, yeah, that's where we get our positive 2. And then our point of interest, x naught, y naught, is this little guy. And that's where we get our x naught and our y naught. Algebra that all into shape, and you get the equation of this line as negative x plus 2y is equal to 4. And just for fun, we could algebra that into shape and solve it for y, just to see that in point slope or slope intercept form, whatever you want to call it. 2y is equal to x plus 4, divided by 2, y is equal to 1 half x plus 2. Sure enough, it's got a slope of uh, rise 1 over run 2, and it crosses the y-axis at the point 0 comma 2. All right, so the gradient. So far, we've been talking about it in uh, two space, but the gradient of the concept of the gradient extends to three space. The gradient of a function, if it has three inputs and one output, is given going to be a vector uh, of the three partials of the function. Partial of f, partial of y, partial of z in this case. And then the directional derivative, that still that formula still stands. The directional derivative of f in the direction of u is the gradient dotted with u. And all the other concepts that we talked about, like the maximum value of the derivative is equal to the magnitude of the gradient, and things like that are also pertinent in space. So let's do an example. If we took a function f is of x, y, z is equal to x to the third minus x times y squared minus z, find the derivative of f at the point 1, 1, 0 in the direction of 2, negative 3, 6. Well, first things we got to do is unit vector length that v down. So take the magnitude of v, scale v down to the unit length. So we have our unit vector is 2 sevenths, negative 3 sevenths, 6 sevenths. Calculate the gradient. Well, each of these is going to be the partial with respect to f, uh, a partial of f with respect to x, the partial of f with respect to y, and the partial of f with respect to z. Looking at our function up here, Partial with respect to x, derivative of the first term is 3x squared. Derivative of negative xy to the second is going to be just negative y to the second, because derivative of x is 1. Derivative of negative z is 0, and there's how we arrive at our f of uh, the partial of f with respect the partial of f with respect to x. Similarly, calculating the partial of f with respect to y, well, the first six, first term, x to the third, has derivative of 0. The second term, minus xy to the second, has derivative of negative 2xy. And then the third term has derivative of 0. Partial with respect to z, well, there's only one, one term with z in it. So that's going to be the last term of our function f. That's going to be minus c, which has its derivative of negative 1. Now we evaluate this thing at the point of interest. So evaluate the gradient at the point of interest by plugging in 1, 1, 0 for x, y, and z respectively and get the output vector, the gradient vector of 2, negative 1, and negative 1. So to calculate the derivative in the direction of u, we use the gradient evaluated at our point and dot it with our unit vector. So dot those two vectors together. And when I wrote this, I accidentally switched order of these. So it's worth noting that this is our unit vector, and that is this. But we know we can switch the order of the dot product safely and get a reasonable result, the same result, in fact. So we see that our derivative is 4 sevenths uh, in the direction of 2, negative 3, 6 at the point 1, 1, 0. Uh, similarly, we can talk about the maximum and minimum values of the derivative uh, in any direction uh, at the given point. That's going to be given by the magnitude of the gradient at that point. So we'll evaluate the gradient at that point as we did before in the last problem. And we'll maximize the direction 
the whole derivative when we take the magnitude of that gradient evaluated at that point, which is three. Similarly, the minimum direction is going to be, or the, I'm sorry, not the minimum direction, but the minimum value that the derivative is going to attain is negative three. Okay, our last concept for this lecture, major concept anyway, is tangent lines. So f of x, y equals z is a differentiable function as usual defined on some open set containing a point x naught, y naught, and let u be our directional unit vector, then the tangent line through the point p, x naught, y naught, f of x naught, y naught, in the direction of v is given by, well, here's the equation of a line in space in general is the vector value equation of a line is L of t is equal to p, the vector to some point on our uh, on our surface uh, plus t times v, our directional vector. So the tangent line uh, to our surface f in the x direction is going to use that v director is going to be the v vector is going to be given by one comma zero comma the partial with respect to x. Why does this make sense? Because this is the slope of the tangent line in the x direction from that point, and so by putting our run, remember, slope is equal to rise over run. And if run is one, then slope goes on the top. In that case, it's our partial derivative. Similarly, for the y direction, we want our change in unit direction to be in the y direction. And then the change of our, our z output direction will be the slope given by the partial derivative. And so in, if we want to extend this idea to a tangent line to our surface in uh, at a point in any direction given by u, u being a unit vector importantly, then the, the v directional vector of that tangent line above is going to be ux, uy, the x and y coordinates of our unit vector, and then the directional derivative of f in the direction of u. The slope of the, literally meaning the slope of the tangent line to our surface, uh, at our point. Okay, so here's, that's tangent lines. Here's normal lines. In this case, if you have f of x, y is equal to z, a differentiable function on an open set containing a point, then the normal line through the point, uh, p is the same as before, with normal vector to our surface f given by n is equal to the partial with respect to x evaluated at our input point, the partial with respect to y evaluated at an point and negative one is going to be given by L of t is equal to p to get to that point on our surface plus the n directional vector. And it's worthy of note that that's really just a shortcut. So recall that the equation of a plane with normal vector n is equal to a, b, c through the point x naught, y naught, z naught is given by this general formula that we've seen before for a plane. Applying what we've just been talking about, we have that tangent planes can be defined as f of x, y is equal to z. If we have a function, differentiable function, open set containing our point with the tangent plane same, through our usual point p with normal vector given to f, normal vector to f given by n is equal to, as we saw last time, the partials of x evaluated, the partial of y evaluated at negative one then we can replace, we're just substituting in A, is this. B is this. And C is negative one. Why is it that way? Well, this, this N, the format of N here, is what you're going to get if you take the cross product of those vectors shown over here. If you take the cross product of t, so let's get a pen, t sub x, t sub y, take the cross product of those, and you'll end up with this n vector. And that's it. That's the end of our discussion uh, about directional derivatives.